Hello everybody and welcome to Wine Library TV. I'm your host, Gary Vaynerchuk. So, big episode today. What we're going to be doing is uh, kosher wine. You know, the holidays are approaching and kosher wine is now uh, something a lot of people are looking for out there if you uh, celebrate those holidays. But more importantly, and this is really what WLTV is all about, we want to talk about kosher wine as wine. I mean, I think people only drink kosher wine during the holidays, and obviously a very small segment of the whole world drinks kosher wines or celebrates those holidays. And so there's opportunities and deals out there, and there's quality kosher wine. There's a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of truths. So we're going to talk about them a little bit, and we're going to taste four separate kosher wine today, and I'm pretty excited about it. Before we do that, I want to give a big, big shout out. You know, we don't do too, too many. Sometimes we do it, but huge, huge shout out to the guy known as SS Chris. You know, it was kind of just driving and I was like, geez, this guy does a whole lot. If you don't know SS Chris, Chris Nisi is a great, great follower of Wine Library TV and started a spreadsheet for himself. And we have a link up here in the top corner. And we've also started a big link, and you might have noticed the change last uh, yesterday, a huge link right underneath the video of all my reviews. And this is maintained by one of the great maniacs um, SS Chris, as we love to call him. So I, I think for the obnoxious amount of work, sometimes when there's lots and lots of wines, and doing it every day, and the way he keeps up, he needs a huge shout out. So that's what we're gonna do. He's also a big Mets fan, so he's going to be really excited for Sunday night, big game, opening day. We're here, baseball season. Wow, unbelievably quick how some things come along. Anyway, other than that, kosher wines are very interesting, and I'm really excited to talk about them today. I have not had any of the, uh, excuse me, I've had three of these, reverse. I've had only one of these. I've not had the first three. The fourth one is a very interesting wine that I almost debated doing a show on all by itself. And we'll talk about that when we get to that. See, now you're kind of like, you want to get there, right? Oh, junk. They can use the uh, Viddler tag and jump to it. Don't do it, please. Stay with me here. Darn it, the Viddler tag. Spoil, Viddler, you did it again. All right, let's do this. We're going to start with this wine right here. This is the Yarden 2005 Sauvignon Blanc. Yarden is a great producer from Israel. 12 bucks, no rating, and um, very, very interesting stuff. Now, now, one thing about kosher wines is that only Sabbath-observing Jews can touch the wines in any process whatsoever, at any point, handling the grapes, in the vineyards, the bottling, that's it. All the machines and the mechanisms that are used to making the wine have to be kosher. The vines in Israel, which is obviously a place where a lot of kosher wine come from, have to be at least four years old. But that's only an Israeli thing, as we have an Italian wine and we have some California wines also. So um, when in Israel, they need to be at least four years old. The yeasts, the fining materials, all of them need to be kosher. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, kosher wines have limitations. And I think a lot of people just assume that that allows them to not make quality wine. One thing I should definitely bring up, I'd be remiss not to bring up, is that Israel is starting to make some phenomenal non-kosher wines. And we're really getting excited about it, so much so that we're reorganizing our shelves downstairs to create an Israeli section, non-kosher. So there's a lot of quality, the growing region is right. It's, there's a lot of opportunity for that part of the world to create great, great wine. Of course, wine pretty much comes from that general area of the world. So lots of interesting stuff. Again, comes down to marketing, misperceptions, and things of that nature with kosher wine. I think most people think of kosher wines as being junky and sweet and, and you know just low, low quality. And so, uh, I'm really excited about what I've seen over the last three or four years, so let's see if that is true. We're gonna start with the Yarden, which is, a, I think, a great, great producer. Um, this is a $12 Sauvignon Blanc, and let's give it a whirl. This is produced from the Golan Heights area of Israel, which produces some of the best wines in the area. This wine has a tremendously fruity palette going on. A little too much heat and a little off balance, but nice crispness, caught a little bit half pregnant. Trying to be a little too new world, it's a, trying to be minerally, trying to be a little too creamy and oaky. I think it's caught a little half pregnant and that, that's a little bit disturbing. On the nose, you're getting a really nice gooseberry and, and a little bit of lemon peel, almost like the lemon peel that you put on an espresso. Um, 
which is different than the lemon peel you don't put on an espresso. Um, but, you know, a solid bottle of wine. I'm actually somewhat disappointed with this effort. It's not a good start for me uh, cheering on kosher wines. Uh, I'm going to score this wine 84 points. It's not a great effort in my opinion, but it is a good producer and you should seek out some yarn and wines. This one just did not do it for me. And we're off to a bad start. Let's move on. This is the Seagulls uh, 2003 Cabernet Special Reserve. So it's really important. 13.5% uh, Hulda Israel is where it comes from. 14 bones. And uh, this is a very popular wine in our shop. So I'm excited to find out why. We've been selling a lot of this the last couple of days. And so I wanted to see what people are drinking. So I popped that on. And so let's see what's going on. $14, nice price point. Let's see what's going on here. Nice solid color, really not too bad at all, nice and dark, Cabernet, people like the cabs these days. Let's give it a whirl. I would love this more than anything in the world right now. I would love for every person watching this video to do a blind tasting and to take five Napa Valley Cabernets. Let's say Sterling. Let's say, uh, let's say Simi, which I know is Alexander Valley. Let's, five California Cabs. Simi, Sterling, what else sells in that 20, 15 to 20 dollar range? Rodney Strong, what's that? Berenger. Berenger, great one Eric, nice job. Eric coming through huge. And blind taste it with throwing in the seagulls in a blind tasting. Get everybody together, do a blind tasting. I will tell you right now, without any hesitation, there is no way this wine will come in last, and many times will not only come in second or third, but may win the tasting. This is an extremely well-polished, elegant, oaky, I mean, let's go. <sighs> he's here, he's definitely here. Oh, he's there, but a little more subtle, you know, almost like a baby oak monster. The baby! There's always the baby, right? There's the big oak monster. The little baby oak monster makes its first cameo and welcome to the party because it's really bringing a baby oak element to it, but the raspberry and the cherry is very refined and the finish is what really has me shocked and appalled at this effort because it's, it's fruity, it's luscious, it's got a little hint of charcoal and then it's silky smooth. I mean, smooth as a baby's behind. I mean, it really is that smooth. This is good wine. This is good, good wine. I'm gonna score this wine 89 points. It's an extremely strong effort Cabernet and it's $14. And here's the classic example because there is at least 500 Cabernets I've tasted in the last 133 days that are not 89 point wines that are more expensive than $14. And so this is a prime example of a wine that's gonna probably only be bought by the world over the next six to eight weeks, except for certain pockets. Six to eight weeks, what am I talking about? The two week window. And um, except for little pockets with, throughout the country, but a wine for wine lovers who are just not close-minded and a little bit more open to the wine world and trying different things that really need to seek this out and be stunned by the quality. Because once again, because of perception, sometimes these wines are unable to command in the open market the right price for the quality that they deliver in the bottle. And as a matter of fact, that is the common thing that goes on in the wine industry, not the exception. Let's move on. This is interesting. Let's talk about this. This is a lot of fun. This is the Rashi 2000 Barolo, made from 100% Nebbiolo grapes, because that's where Barolos come from. There is no Barolo grape, it's Nebbiolo. This wine is 91 points, Wine Spectator. And it's $31, and it's from Italy. And guess what? It's a kosher wine. So again, that four year rule with the vines is not obviously pertained to uh, this area. and. Uh, and our, our good friend Rabbi Garelic and Rabbi Benlau and Rabbi Zinner have uh, made this kosher for Passover. So that's nice. And 91 points Wine Spectator, huge score. And it's a 2000 Piedmonte. You may recall Spectator said that was like the vintage of all vintages, 100 point vintage. And 31 Bones, which is a very, very fair price for Barolo. 
Let's ask the question right now. There's not that many $30 Barolo 91 pointers from 2000 vintage in the marketplace. They're much more in the 50 to $75 range. So we're seeing a common thread here. And you know, it's got the classic Piedmonte coloring, which is a little bit lighter than the normal, you know, uh, Cabernet style. You can actually see your fingers through the glass. And for some people that is a bad thing, but they're wrong. Um, no, we don't say they're wrong. That's just their opinions, but they may be wrong. Let's give it a whirl. Very classic sour cherry. Um, I hate to use this, and this has nothing to do with it being a kosher wine. This is something I get out of a lot of Barolos, and I'm gonna have to bring it out. I've been holding it back, but this reminds me of Brian Chen's throw up. Bear with me. Second grade, a little too much chocolate milk, a little throw up in the cafeteria. I was sitting there, it was close by. We were trading stickers, you know, the ones you smell. Oh, that coffee was awesome. Remember, the, remember the skunk, the stinky. You don't know. Please, somebody out there, remind Eric and everybody else about the stickers that used to be scratch and sniffs, and there was a skunk. Come on, and the bones and the witch. It was wild stuff. Anyway, this wine and other Barolos, for some unknown reason, remind me of that. You just remembered, didn't you? Before my time. <laughs> Before you're such a jerk. Eric claims he's so much younger than me. Anyway. Um, it has that element. I don't know why, but it hits me home. And there's a lot of times wine terms that I write for myself when I buy for the store that I use that are so specific to me. Sure, I use some fun analogies on the show and in general, but there's some that are so specific to you. And today's question of the day is, what is the biggest tasting note? Not the biggest. What is the one tasting note you've ever said, either within your own mind or on paper, that is your specific tasting note that nobody else might understand? Because mine is Brian Chen's throw up. And that's what this wine has in the nose. Let's give it a whirl. Nice grip on this wine. Great tannin structure. You know, lovely floral lilac flavors that, are, that accompany a lot of these wines. A little hint of pepper, which I like. Tiny, tiny feeling of little leather. Um, leather venison kind of combination, a little dirty, a little dusty, little little dust in the air. You know, you might want to dust up a little bit with this wine. Um, it, it falls a little short, uh, short. It falls a little short, um, matey. Um, but it's you know it's falling a little short on my palate. Uh, I find it to be a little bit of a disappearing wine. Um, I like to call these Casper wines. So I'm gonna call this wine a Casper wine um, because it disappears on the finish. And Casper wines make me sad. They should make you sad as well. And I'm not, we use the witch thing. I could use Wendy the witch. I'm a big Casper fan. Huge Casper aficionado. So holler at me if you got an old t-shirt or something. Lunchbox, I'll take it, please. Um, I think Spectator's way overboard in this rating. You know, I'm disappointed because I would have loved to tell you guys about how there's some amazing high quality uh, kosher wines out there that are 30, 40, 50, 60 dollars. Some, a lot of them come from Bordeaux. We have one from California, Convy, and it's great stuff. Big scores, 90 to 92 Parker. This one's falling way short, actually. I think this is an 87 point wine at best. I'm very disappointed with it, and that's just the way it is sometimes. And now, one of the most interesting wines that have ever been on Wine Library TV, and I'm going to explain the whole kit and caboodle to you why. This is the uh, Baron Herzog Jonis 2006. Cabernet, and this is $11. And I'm gonna to explain to you why um, Joe Herleman, a winemaker, has produced something very interesting. Now this is from California, and from the Central Coast. And I'm gonna explain this wine very carefully. I think, had this wine not been a kosher wine, this concoction, let's call it, that it could become one of the bigger phenomenons for a short term, short to medium term, which is five to 10 years, of wine in the American wine world. And I'll tell you why. This is a semi-sweet Cabernet. And I've tasted this wine once before. I tasted it again to just refresh my memory so I can really drill home my point. Great color, 11 bones, great price for a Cabernet. Taste the rainbow. You know, Skittles is in the hizzy right now. And that's great, because Skittles hasn't made an appearance on WLTV in a while. Great Skittles flavor. Classic, 
tangerine flavor as well. You know when tangerine peel, you could just you know put your hand, you know, squeeze a little bit and you could smell it? You're getting a lot of that tangerine peel on the nose. Wine is semi-sweet. It's got a nice black cherry flavor component going on. Really dark raspberry. And the whole flavor profile is extremely jammy and extremely, you know, extracted. Very new world in that matter. It is that level right above. If this wine took one turn down, one turn, in blind tastings it would be mistaken for $60 Barossa Shiraz, for example. Or, you know, because it's got that Fruit, you know, those classic fruit bombs have so much of that residual sugar. This has a little bit more than that. However, I believe there is an absolute need out there for a wine of this nature. We have had this discussion lots of times amongst our wine staff. People come in and ask for a little bit sweeter or fruitier. And you give them Beaujolais and you give them all these other wines that you kind of give to somebody looking for a fruity red wine. And they're just not happy. Because at the end of the day, they're still dry wines. Zinfandels, Merlots, Beaujolais, they just don't work. And, um, and this wine does work and will hit lots and lots of palates right. As a matter of fact, this is a great wine that I've started using to segue people away from white Zinfandel, for example. And so they're getting, you know, they're getting a little bit of the best of both worlds. They're still getting their sugar, their sugar fix, you know, and you know you want to keep those guys, people under control. But they're getting some true red wine elements in there. The black currant that comes through a little bit in this, the finish, the structure, the tannins are there much more. And it's a very intriguing wine to me. And really what I said to myself after I tasted this wine was, wow, if this wasn't kosher, and this was a brand out of California that marketed it, had a little fun, this is not too far off to what people are going bonkers over. And I mean like, boing, over Yellowtail. And let's talk about other wines that have a little bit more sugar than their friends in their categories. Kendall Jackson, Chardonnay, another phenomenon. Santa Margarita Pinot Grigio. You following the trend here? Hey, Americans! We like the sugar. Now I think that's gonna change because we're not growing up on soda pop anymore. I'm going south on you there. A little soda pop or pop. We're not growing up on pop anymore. We're a little bit more of a water culture. So I do think see things changing. However, if you've got somebody who likes the sweet stuff and you don't want to give them the mannish habits and you don't want to give them the white Zinfandel and you want to mix it up and get them into wine a little bit at a very minimal cost. This is the first product that's ever come across my desk. I was stunned and I was really into it. Again, the cachet of being kosher is going to limit this. And I feel bad for Baron Herzog Winery because somebody else is going to come out and do this and they're going to be like, what about us? You know, like the pockets and there's no change in it. Think of that character, like this, the lip, the whole nine. It's a nice wine. I like it. It's an 85 point wine for me. I mean, it's nothing life changing, but the flavor profile and the kind of wine it is, is very interesting. And just from like, the business of wine standpoint for me, it's very intriguing. And most importantly, I think there's a lot of people. I, I know that every one of you who's watching right now has that person in their lives that needs to try this wine. And they're gonna love you. They're gonna love you good. Don't forget about the question of the day because you, with a little bit of me, ah! <laughs> you wanna know what this is, right? You wanna know what's free. Well, guess what? I'm doing it for you. What this is, is a Vaniac wristband. Beautiful little Vaniac logo, which is lots of fun. And on the back, you know, making soft claims, changing the wine world. And you know what? I like these because when I play basketball and drop 35 on, let's say, Canada Dave, for example, I'll drop 35 on your ass, just so you know. When I do that, sometimes I double them up for the hardcore look. You know, when I wear these, I feel good. You know, I've started working out, and God, nothing feels better than when the Vaniac logo, come on. And you know what? It's time for me to do something for you guys because you're doing so much for me. So, every single person watching this right now can have this for free. All you gotta do is click the link over here or it might be down here if you're not watching it today, but I don't think we'll have them left over, but I bought a crap load. Crap load, so everybody should get one. More than the viewers that there are. All you have to do is click that link and email. It's gonna pop up an email, a prompt up an email pop up, and all you have to do is email your name and your address, and this little puppy is in the mail, but I'm gonna come to your home and take it back unless you send in a picture of you wearing it back to that exact same email. 
You wanna be friends? I do too. Vaniac wristbands coming to you. We'll see you next time on WLTV.